Welcome to The Rich Report, a podcast with news and information on high-performance computing. Today, my guest is Pradeep Dubey from Intel. Pradeep, welcome to the show today. Thank you, Rich. Well, well thanks for coming on, Pradeep. You know, uh, maybe we should start at the beginning. Can you tell us about your role at Intel? So I'm part of Intel Labs. My role is to research on emerging workloads and AI and machine learning and HPC. Okay, and you know, this being the supercomputing show, there's a lot going on, a lot of talk about the overlap between HPC and AI, and I understand you have a slide deck for us today. Well, why don't we start with that and we'll do a Q&A at the end. Okay. So, uh, as I said, we do both high performance computing and AI, and we don't necessarily uh, distinguish between them much because they're not very different. Okay, AI today is seeking more compute than almost anything ever sought. So it's probably the ultimate HPC workload. And it's uh, even uh, more exciting, it's not seeking that amount of compute offline, it's seeking that compute, that amount of compute, excess scale or more compute, real time, constantly, all the time. So the two are driving each other because it brings an angle of massive data which has been less emphasized by traditional HPC which has been simulation dominated and it's bringing the angle of compute which no one understands better than HPC guys. So these things are coming together and it's almost like AI is the killer app. Almost, for HPC yes, yeah. yes. Oh, and and, and all that brings new challenges which is what my uh, talk is going to focus on. Two I already talked about, massive data and massive compute. But there's a third one, and I briefly alluded to this in my prior talks. The third one is AI now brings to HPC a class of experts which HPC never had. Who are these guys? These guys are domain data scientists, domain experts, who know their data science very well, but they are not computer science experts to actually program MPI, OpenMP, CUDA, name it, right? So therefore, they're seeking more performance than anyone ever saw it. At the same time, their willingness to program for it at the low level is nearly non-existent. So how do you deliver them ultimate performance without compromising their ask for productivity? This is a challenge. I That's mean. a big challenge. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. And, and I'll, I'll go through in my uh, uh, talk how... We are trying to make progress in this, right? Deliver them productivity in their end-to-end -end exercise, not just for their, not just for some kernel or for some uh, deep learning subset, but 90% yeah. of the time is spent outside of uh, compute in preparing the data so that you can do the compute, okay. and productivity is end-to-end, -end, right? So, so these guys use R, or Python, and that's, yes. kind of, that's their toolbox. Yeah. But parallelism isn't part of that discussion. Exactly. So what yeah. we are doing now in our uh, new uh, research is to bring parallelism into Python, into R, into uh, new languages like Julia. Mm -hmm. How do you actually deliver performance there without having to compromise productivity. So far what happens is people develop their uh, models, quote unquote, while they're still prototyping different algorithms in those languages. The moment they conclude on it and now they need to go perform or deploy it, then they dump that piece of code and then they start learning C, MPI, whatever it takes to run on a high performance infrastructure. That's what we are trying to change. We want to have them be able to do their performance and productivity, uh, their performance, their prototyping and their performance deployment all staying inside one software infrastructure, high productivity infrastructure. So under the auspice of Intel Labs, right, this cutting edge, how, how do you make that happen? Yes, yeah, so, so we are looking at this, as I said, end to end, really mm -hmm. understand their data challenges, understand where the time is spent, often in transforming the data, bringing the data, uh, getting it to the right form at the right place, right? And you have to address it, and you have to understand where the performance is being lost and what's causing it, right? It's uh, some of these native data structures like, uh, let's say, arrays, right, are not supported right today uh, across uh, distributed infrastructures. And they're also not supported in terms of the exploiting the parallelism that's in the systems like multi-cores and many cores. So we are trying to make that happen so that you support large data structures and large arrays, but on, a, on the compute infrastructure where you can get performance. 
throughout the computer uh, overall uh, uh, distribute them over the compute infrastructure and benefit from all levels of parallelism not just multiple nodes but inside the node multiple cores be friendly to the caches be, be friendly to the threads so that the programmer still writes that simple high level code almost like a matlab level code mm -hmm. but the rest of the software tool chain actually exploits and deploys and benefits from every dimension of parallelism that's in the system from multi node to inside the core simd cores threads hmm. and friendly friendly to bandwidth so that you can manage you can feed the parallelism yeah you know in, in the simulation world we have certain apps that are sensitive to latency is that the case here Yes, so the AI is uh, primarily three types of workloads today. It should be, uh, strictly speaking, four. Part of it is training the model once you have the model, because without having the model, the game doesn't even begin. Once you have the model, then you start, uh, then you can go inference with it or classify things with it. So the training part can be offline or online. Today it's mostly offline. And the inferencing part is either batch inferencing, throughput, right, how many images you did, or in some cases, single batch inferencing, where I don't have millions of images, I uh, I want I just have one image. I want to look it up, right? So the latency in that case matters. When you have multiple images or multiple tasks, the throughput matters. Queries per second, as opposed to how many seconds it, did, it took to do one query, right? And and the, uh, and training is just about time to train. Okay. And how far away is these efforts? I mean, is this ten years away what you're working on, or is this coming near term? No. So we have made significant progress on all of these, meaning time to train, the throughput of training, as well as uh, the latency of each uh, uh, single batch inferencing or single queries, all of those have improved significantly. Let me just give you a feel for one of those, right? So the training itself, right, uh, pick whichever uh, um, network, uh, let's say ResNet is very commonly used uh, these days, ResNet 50. If you simply look at the amount of compute that's in there, and if it was, and it is in principle paralyzable. So if you simply paralyzed it and used one of this, whichever data center or supercomputer um, uh, infrastructure today, you should be able to just finish it off in a uh, few seconds, less than a minute for sure, right? 10 seconds, 20 seconds. Doesn't happen, it takes 100 hours. Why? Be and, and we're talking just like uh, within last year or two, right? That's what it used to take, and because it was very hard to paralyze, and that and people could barely paralyze it past uh, eight GPUs, right? So there were uh, boxes being sold for just just that because that's all you could do, right? And although it was taking hours and hours, but we could not. And the fundamental issue had to do with uh, something called uh, mini batch size, which you could not because that was that was limiting the parallelism. My batch size is only 128. How do I deploy a thousand nodes because each node will only get less than an less than an image? So. Fundamental research we did and and others, right, which now has made it possible to have much larger batch size, batch size as large as 8K, 32K, now uh, even uh, hundreds of K, uh, 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 large batch size. That makes it possible now to scale deep learning training. And you have seen probably just in the last few months only, that time that I was talking about hundreds of hours went down to uh, 20, uh, one hour, uh, and that was a press release. And then at uh, 50 minutes, that was another press release. 30 minutes, another press release. And this week, 15 minutes, another press release. And it can actually go down to a minute or less. So just see, I mean, how many, uh, it doesn't happen that many times that we go down from uh, uh, tens or hundred hours to uh, um, minutes in all in a matter of a year or year plus. That's how much progress has been made on the same piece of hardware, only through algorithm and software. Algorithm and software. Wow, that's amazing. And then uh, uh, what, you talked about the data intensive. Is, is memory a big piece of this, getting all that to fit? Yeah, very good questions. Yeah. So, so far, unfortunately, uh, memory has not been as big a deal. Why? Because we could easily fit these uh, uh, ImageNet type problems, which is, let's just say, ImageNet is ImageNet 1K, right? When you have looking for 1K uh, objects, right? Cats, dogs, whatever, right? So if you simply look at uh, the uh, the last uh, layer, the fully connected layer, mo um, uh, 1K times 1K, it's only a million parameters, no more than that. And so people are able to nicely fit these things in the small memory, whichever, uh, uh, however many 
low gigabytes. So memory is not the problem. It's the, and that's how I said, oh, I, I should be able to do this compute in like on gone some super, super computer and just finish it in, in, in minutes or less than an hour. Why is it taking so long? And that's how compute has helped so much, right? Just figuring out how to do paralyze the compute and figure out all these other algorithmic tricks without, it, it has worked beautifully because that compute in principle could have been easily fed. But soon it will change because these are still toy problems, right? Yeah. If you actually move from that ImageNet 1K-like problem to something a harder problem, now suppose you start classifying images at the pixel level, right? You say, look, it's a, the million pixel in, in almost any image. Everyone has megapixel cameras, right? So if you just simply look at a million pixel image and say, look, I want to classify each pixel, whether this pixel belongs to uh, my nose or, or a tree or, or background or whatever, so that I can literally draw the contour and I, I don't just draw a box around every cat, right? I literally can draw the cat, right? So that requires a pixel level classification. So the million pixel, that same output layer, which was 1K times 1K, now it's million times million. So now you're talking trillions of parameters. So certainly the problem, even for the same image uh, processing, right, and certainly there are other uh, 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 deep learning uh, uh, challenges where the amount of parameters you then have to hold goes suddenly skyrockets. So then the ability to hold them and to hold them at the right place and at the right time and the right subset of them, all that stuff that we have traditionally dealt with in, uh, uh, in the past also becomes very relevant. So soon, yeah. memory will be a, play a much bigger role than it has so far. Yeah, because yeah, it's like these uh, exponential degrees of freedom just growing. Yes. Huh? So we have to move from the, uh, these small benchmarks to real applications. And you see that some of it already in the uh, paper that we have done where we have take, uh, scaled deep learning training not just to hundreds of thousands of nodes, which I already talked about, but to 10,000 nodes, as in Cori Supercomputer, right? That's a real application. That's not a benchmark. So when you're talking about a real application, then it's, it's uh, so much more. It's so much more uh, than just the compute. Yeah, yeah. This is very exciting. What, what, what do you see as far as the impact of this, you know, a, as you reach these new levels of parallelism and scalability? What do you think? So first we have, it's, it's very satisfying. We have learned a lot. The good part is uh, uh, that we have, we, have un, we have learned how to make ourselves and others be much more productive because the most important thing here is to be productive because this field is changing so fast at the algorithmic level, not at the uh, benchmark or low level. The algorithmic level that if you don't offer the productivity, the next deep learning algorithm will miss, right? And it's still changing significantly. We're already moving from CNNs to uh, RNNs and LSTMNs and to other uh, GANs and other all kinds of innovation going on at the algorithmic level. Mm -hmm. To support that, you have to offer huge amount of productivity on highly compute on high performance compute infrastructure. Yeah. So when we learn things which make us very productive, such as a, a deep learning library, right, in DNN, such as how you scale the deep learning li library across to multiple nodes through our MLSL, through a, a CAFE or TensorFlow framework. So these three things, CAFE, uh, Intel CAFE, Intel MLSL, and MKL DNN, we commonly use them across all these experiments where we are sometimes running on some Xeon infrastructure, some uh, Xeon Phi infrastructure, on some sometimes in Stampede, sometimes in cloud. Across the board, we have used the same, we could port our code and try all these systems out. Why? Because underly, under, uh, underlying in between the software infrastructure was common across them. That's how we could just yeah. go around the globe and look for wherever we could run and get the best performance. If we had to code that many times, we would have not done it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you about silicon because it seems like there's like 50 different things coming out and startups and all kinds of different ways to do what you're describing. But it seems to me what they're talking about is just a single node level. Yes, exactly. So silicon, let's talk about silicon. So yeah. at the node level, this is what is happening, right? At the lower, at the node level, the processor level. Let's stay with processor, yeah. right? Intel is a processor company still. Sure. Uh, this is what is happening, right? In the, uh, we have uh, the uh, the fun, uh, in all this AI world is data driven, and so data parallelism, data dri uh, level parallelism is the is the king. That's why you're getting millions and billions. It's not million billion uh, tasks. It's million million pixels to work on. Okay, so that data level parallelism is the king, right? Data intensive compute. That fundamental attribute of processor architecture that has been uh, that has exploited or or made data level parallelism happen is decades old. Cindy, okay. 
which is only the short vector one dimensional thing right mm -hmm. and and i'm surprised it has lasted that many uh, that many years multiple decades it was not supposed to if you ask me and so now we are finally moving from that 1d parallelism to 2d okay which is matrix that's the next level operator right next level data structure not just an uh, 1d vector array but a 2d uh, tile 2d matrix fancier names you can uh, come up with but this 2d parallelism is the next level architectural progression that is happening as we speak and there are many 2d tile processors coming up and we have some others have some you, the third progression is how do you make this 2D tile even more uh, efficient by reconfiguring it, configuring it. Now, we already have a very fine-grained configuration of compute tile, namely FPGAs, but uh, it has its own challenges. But this is the, these are the three uh, uh, dimensions of parallelism, 1D, 2D, and then uh, configurable 2D, right? And all of these are happening and a lot of innovation going into making this happen, and therefore you see so many uh, companies and startups playing in the space because it's been certainly become very exciting to actually be delivering sil at the silicon level innovation at the architectural level innovation. That's really exciting. So, uh, you know, I was just going to ask you about this week at Supercomputing. What's, what's your mission? What's your prime objective? Yeah, so uh, prime, prime objective is anytime you're with so many smart people, <laughs> it's always exciting to learn how, what progress have, have others made because this is one field where you can today find so many smart people all thinking this problem. Rarely have we had so many smart brains suddenly excited because we see a huge opportunity. An opportunity to fundamentally change computing, right? Change what computing has done and change how computing has been done. Okay, both are changing. Okay, we have finally, so that has brought so many smart people into this field that an, an opportunity, any opportunity to engage them such at a forum like this is not to be missed, right? I, I agree, and it, it's going to be a terrific week, and it, it, it is very energizing to be around all these smart folks with this, this objective of this AI has really, like, energized the whole community, it seems. Yes, let's yeah. get machines to make decisions yeah. better than us. Yeah. I'm all for it. So, so Pradeep, I really want to thank you for coming on the show today. I've enjoyed this discussion, and uh, have a great week at SC. Thank you. That's it for the Rich Report. Stay tuned for more news and information on high-performance computing.